Good morning, good morning, good morning. I miss everybody. I miss those hugs, those laughters, those me being silly. I know y'all miss it too, but anyway. Um, I'm going to read um, Psalms 118, starting at um, verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteousness shall, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. And then I'm turning it on. And it is marvelous in his eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he is made, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the fest of sacrifice with cords upon the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Your word is like a lamp unto my feet. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we surrender this service unto you, Father God. For this is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Be glad in this day, Father God, for we know not what tomorrow holds, but you do. So, Father God, in this day, Lord, as we begin to worship, as we begin to even go through the service, Lord, bless this day. Bless our understanding. Take us where you need us to go, Lord. Continue to grow us. Continue to pour out your grace and your mercy and your steadfast love over your congregation. We give you praise and honor for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Allison. Catherine, praise the Lord. That was awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, may those the declarations and the, the, the petitions that were manifested in the words of those songs, may they come to pass in our midst. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. Amen. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, whom shortly uh, we will be bringing him um, <clears throat> live <laughs> from Greensboro, North Carolina. And then I'm going to uh, do the Lord's Supper as well. First of all, Apostle Reggie Holiday is my friend. He's my brother in the Lord. He's my co-laborer in the gospel. And he is, is just a man of uh, great integrity, a man of great anointing, uh, a man of great passion to see the Father's house built in the midst of the church in the earth. Uh, he pastors Bethany uh, Fellowship in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, he's the head of a network of churches known, known as NUMA, Network. He hosts a national prayer time on Sunday mornings. He has a school of ministry in which he equips the saints to do the work of the ministry. He's involved in a number of uh, initiatives domestically and globally. And uh, we are really uh, looking forward to his sharing today. Uh, he and I are uh, participate in a weekly pastoral Zoom call that's hosted by a prophet, Chuck Porta, uh, from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Reggie D. 
did a, a presentation, maybe about a 15 minute presentation on the father's house. And um, let's see what's, what I'm getting here. Okay. I thought maybe Reggie was texting me and saying, no, no, you, you, you said that wrong. I'm just kidding. Just wanted to check though. And he shared for 15 minutes on the Father's House. We've talked about it. I've heard him share about it before. I've, I've read things that he's written on it. But in that 15 minutes, it was so powerful just to hear him declaring about just building the Father's House. And I just said, Reg, could you just share that message sometime with us? And of course, he was glad to do that. And we're going to get blessed. I know my wife and I, as we were waiting before the Lord, New Year's Eve, she got a word from the Lord, I got a word from the Lord. We wait together in the presence of the Lord, usually on New Year's Eve, and the word she got is, there's just something missing. And and the sense that she got was for the purposes of the Lord to move forward, there's, there's, there's something missing. Well, we need apostolic impartation to supply those things that are missing. And we're believing the Lord we're going to get an apostolic impartation when Apostle Reggie shares this morning. So um, for those of you who uh, we're, we'll be switching off after we do uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. By the way, I forgot to bring my uh, communion couplet up here. If somebody could run it up me, uh, run it up here to me. Um, after communion, then we'll be switching off for a few minutes and then we'll come back on with Apostle Holiday. Thank you. So, having done the introduction, let's go to Isaiah 57 for the, for the Lord's Supper. We have been studying Isaiah 40 through 66 uh, in our church, just reading the word of the Lord and just, just having the Lord speak to us powerfully. And in Isaiah 57, I want to read this. Uh, we're going to start in verse 14. And it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the road, remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. And this is a theme that, of course, that's, that's what Isaiah 40 begins with, about, about prepare the way of the Lord. Establish a highway in the wilderness so that my people can return from Babylon back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city and the walls, rebuild Zion, rebuild the temple. And when we also look at what Apostle Holiday is going to share, build up, build up, prepare the road, remove the obstacles out of the way of my people to build the Father's house. I think that goes right along here with Isaiah 57. For this is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is the Holy One. I live in a high and a holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. Somebody who's crushed and broken in spirit. Someone who's humble in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I will not accuse forever, nor will I always be angry. And this is the Lord speaking. For then the spirit of man would grow faint before me, the breath of man that I have created. I was enraged by his sinful greed. I punished him. I hid my face in anger. Yet he kept on in his willful ways. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. If anything embodies what the Lord's Supper is all about, it's this passage right here. In spite of our sinful ways, the Father sent the Son, and because of the Son's sacrifice, I have seen his ways. Nonetheless, I will heal him. I will guide him and restore comfort to him, creating praise on the lips of the mourners in Israel. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. So, Lord, we... Uh, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we partake of your body. 
Thank you for strength. Thank you for life. Thank you for breath. Thank you for healing. Thank you, Lord, that part of what it means that you are holy is that you dwell in a high and holy place with those who are crushed and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. Thank you that you have done this for us in Jesus. And Lord, we partake of your blood, Lord. You've cleansed us in the blood of the Lamb that we might stand worthy before you and build the Father's house. Grant it to us in this day. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. God bless all of you. Go in peace. For at least the next seven or eight minutes, we will be, we're going to shut off now and we're going to transfer to a Apostle Holiday in Greensboro, North Carolina. You, you want to hear this word, so come on back and join us at 11. God bless you. Good morning. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. I guess I am live now. Uh, good morning, saints of the Most High God. Good morning, those that are a part of Lord of the Harvest Church. Uh, we're navigating uh, yet and still uh, the uh, uh, landscape, I guess you could call it, that has been presented to us um, by COVID-19. And yet we, I think we are doing fairly well. And I see that we're live also on Facebook. And so um, I'm gonna get into the word of the Lord in just a moment. I wanna say just a couple of things. I am Reggie Holiday. Um, I noticed that uh, in uh, some of your uh, communications, you had me listed as an apostle, Reggie Holiday. I prefer just to be called Reggie. Uh, I am your brother and uh, just glad that we're all a part of the body of Christ. Uh, I do have the privilege of being a part of a team of leaders uh, for NUMA Ministries International, and uh, which is just a fellowship of uh, uh, Bible believing, Bible teaching churches. I guess that's the best way to put it. And I'm one of the elders here at Bethany Fellowship Church in the city of Greensboro, North Carolina. So uh, I thank you all for having me this morning. I, I'm so grateful for uh, the friendship that I have with your pastor, Mike Osminski, uh, and uh, thank God for him and for his wife, Jan, as well. Um, they are two blessings and treasures to uh, the body of Christ and uh, to you all who are there at Lord of the Harvest and, and to the Detroit area. They, they're a blessing uh, to you all. And so I, I'm thankful for, for Oz. Um, we talk quite a bit each week, uh, either by text or email, sometimes by phone calls. Uh, he allows me to bother him um, with questions that I have, things that I'm mulling over. And uh, so, I mean, we need friends like that, that are in the body of Christ uh, individuals that stretch us and can correct us and so forth. Uh, I, I want to talk to you this morning. I want to share um, what I believe is a revelation that the Lord has given, given to me uh, concerning building the Father's house. Uh, before we go into that, I want to do two things. Uh, I want to talk to you about our school of equipping, uh, which is uh, at present, an online uh, equipping and training uh, center, if you will. Uh, Oz has been a guest lecturer for us, especially this past time where we had a six-week biblical ministry intensive that focused on uh, properly stewarding the prophetic function. Uh, but you can find out more about the school at uh, www.schoolofequipping.org. Um, and I hope I have that right. Uh, but it is School of Equipping International is the, the official name of the school. And uh, if you're looking for opportunities just to grow or to develop, uh, maybe even to, to, to teach or to lecture, who knows? Uh, check us out. Uh, this is something that we are 
uh, actually doing here in the States and, and then in East Africa, uh, where we have launched a school of equipping. Uh, they're presently meeting in per person. Um, we planted churches now in, uh, in Kenya and Uganda and in Tanzania um, and somewhere in, you know, in the neighborhood of 300 churches altogether. But we're training and equipping leaders and those that serve in the body of Christ in Kenya and here in, in Africa as well. Um, so check that out. And uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, either send me an email or uh, give it to Pastor Oz and, uh, and then we can make sure you get the information that you need. I want to call your attention this morning to Isaiah chapter two. And uh, uh, we're actually, let's go to Micah, Micah chapter four verses one through five. Um, interestingly, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, this particular message was so important that God gave it to two prophets, uh, almost identical uh, was the word that he gave to both Micah and to Isaiah. And so I wanna read Micah chapter four, verses one through five, and then I'm gonna pray and then we'll We'll see what the Lord will, will say to us. I want to thank the elders and those of you who have been praying for me uh, and for this time. Uh, I, I believe that this is a significant moment uh, for, for Lord, Lord of the Harvest, uh, for the work and the calling that you all have uh, in uh, the, the city of Detroit, in Warren, uh, in that area. Um, your ministry has, uh, I think, particular importance to what it is that God has ordained uh, for these last days. Your church is uh, called, I believe, to be an apostolic center, an apostolic church at a minimum, uh, which is needed in, in these last days. And I'm, I'm sure you've been hearing about both the prophetic and the apostolic imperatives that drive uh, who we are and what we do in these last days. But nevertheless, Micah chapter four, the Bible reads, verse one, now it should come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. If you're on Facebook Live, let me know if you can hear me. Uh, loud and clear, either give me a thumbs up or an amen, type something in the in the chat box, praise the Lord. Uh, verse two of, of Micah four says, many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Amen. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore, but everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree and no one shall make them afraid for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken for all his, for all people rather, for all people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Father, we thank you for uh, this time of ministry and sharing around your word. Uh, we don't take this time lightly, and so we pray that above all that you would make it all that you intend for it to be. Uh, you saw this time, this day before, Father God, uh, the, the worlds were founded, and so you know where we are. You know what needs to be said. You know what these your precious people need to hear. Uh, we pray that the Spirit of God will breathe on our time, and Lord God, that you would birth uh, not only in the earth, but in this church, those things uh, that you, Lord God, have ordained. I pray for the anointing upon me. Uh, the word is already anointed, but it's, it's your servants and your people who need to be anointed to hear and to receive. 
So God, we commit ourselves to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. So I, I really don't have a, a title uh, for this particular message. If you have to have one, uh, it's it's building the Father's house. Uh, maybe as we as we share this time together, uh, we'll, we'll figure out something to call it. But I just want to I want to say this uh, that I believe the times in which we live they require that we have a fresh revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for those of us who comprise his church, the last days necessitate that we look to him and that we correctly see him, that we correctly, that we properly, that we accurately see the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in order that we can endure and overcome all that we are currently going through and all that we will experience. Uh, we know uh, through prophets that we uh, believe that we can uh, trust their accuracy as it pertains to what the Lord is saying, that things that we have been experiencing uh, will continue. They may even get worse. I'm not a, I'm not a doomsayer, but uh, we understand what the scripture says. And we see that even the times that we're living in now, as those days that can be characterized even as the beginning of sorrows. And so the Lord has called us, uh, I, I think, to know how to be equipped and to be enabled to both endure those things that uh, he's not going to change, amen, uh, but these things will make us stronger and overcome those things that the enemy will seek to utilize to uh, take us away, if you will, from the will of the Lord, to lure us away from what it is that God has for us. So we, we also uh, need this fresh revelation of Jesus Christ in order to accurately understand and then to apply who it is that we are to be and what it is that we are to do during the, the days or these days uh, that we're facing. This fresh apostolic vision, what I want to call it, a revelation is similar to what John was afforded on the Isle of Patmos uh, that he was given to proclaim in uh, uh, Revelation chapter one, uh, that which he was given to to uh, to share, you know, with the um, seven churches, amen, concerning what lay ahead of them. And so the revelation of all revelations we know and understand is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the revelation of all revelations. And so whatever God chooses to reveal, to unveil, to pull back the covers off of, it ultimately should affect how we are situated in him and allow us to see Christ better. Again, what God is sharing, what God is communicating, what God is revealing, what you're hearing you know, on a regular basis from from Pastor Oz and from others, amen? The Lord is situating us in Christ to allow us to see Christ better, I believe, so that we can follow him uh, in, in, a, in a more zealous and a, in a more proper way. So appropriately seeing Jesus is a matter of where it is that we sit or where it is that we have been positioned by the Lord so that we might see him um, and that we might see everything else. Simply put, what we see will determine what we seek, what we say, and what we seize. I wish I had time to deal with that, but I don't. The Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles were allowed to see things from God's eternal perspective. And we know, according to Ephesians chapter two, we've been seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So our, our seats have been changed, as it were, on purpose so that we can see Christ better. Amen. We're situated in him so we can see him better, so we can see how to navigate these times, how to share the gospel, how we can be effective in the things of the Lord. But just like the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles, we're being allowed to see things from God's eternal perspective. Now, to a certain extent, I believe that the Lord uh, has been revealing Christ 
amen, to and in me. I think this is one of the reasons where that Pastor Oz asked me to come online and to share this message with you after having heard it in, on various occasions and reading it as I'm actually writing a book about it as well. But I believe that the Lord is revealing Christ to me and in me in an end times way uh, to proclaim him to his church for the days in which we now live as well as the days to come. And this, is, this is, has been a progressive revelation for me. The Lord is unfolding it a little bit at a time here, and then he's reaffirming some things there. Uh, he's reassuring me in certain things. He's helping me to see certain things properly. But I want you to know that these days, they have the potential to deceive us. They have the potential to distract us. They have uh, even the, the potential to depress. Of course, you're seeing the division in the body. It's almost like it is growing uh, in measures and in ways that those of us who have been working for unity and reconciliation, if we're not careful, we can be discouraged by, by these days that we're in and the things that are taking place. But th these days, they, if we're not careful, they can dissuade us, they can disrupt us, or they can dis disconnect us. Many people have been disconnected from the body of Christ and from the things of God. Yet the Father's will is that I believe that these times in which we live, that they cause us to look to the Lord Jesus and to see him like perhaps we've not seen him so that we might know him and know how to navigate these times effectively. The father has shown me, as I said, he's, he's giving me this progressive revelation, but he has shown me and is showing me that his eternal aim is to have a household or family of sons who would be just like his son, Jesus Christ. A lot of people have been saying, well, what is the Lord up to? Or where's the church? Or what should the church be about? I am convinced that the church needs to be about what the father has eternally concerned himself with. And that is having a family or a household of sons who would mature and develop and grow just like his son, Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, the Lord has established and raise one household after another under uh, the auspices, if you will, of his eternal household and giving them a revelation or giving them a covenant or, or, or giving them a covenant rather, disclosing more and more of the Christ we are to be. All of this is designed for us to see the Christ that we are to be. And at the same time, he uses various means to lead us to repentance so that we can be reordered, so that we can be revived, so that we can be reformed, and so that we can be restored. Ultimately, what I see is the Father's house first as the Lord Jesus Christ. When I talk about building the Father's house, I see the Father's house first as the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Father's house. And then all those who are born again into the family of God, of God or to his household, amen, we make up the house. We, we, are, we are those who he eternally desires to become full-grown sons, just like his son, Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, I think is a critical verse, because it tells us that the end or aim is that we all are to arrive at this threefold destination, or this threefold destiny of oneness, not unity, but oneness in its most accurate translation. The first aspect is that there's a oneness of the faith, oneness of the faith. Secondly, that there's a oneness of the full, thorough, and accurate knowledge of the Son of God. And then thirdly, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, this is the end, the, the fivefold ministry, offices or gifts, whatever you call them, praise the Lord, just like the Great Commission, all of these are not are, are means and not the end. And we, we, we've conflated the fivefold ministry gifts as, as important as they are and given them a place within the body of Christ, even allow the prophetic uh, gifting and office to have a, a place in the body of Christ that, that seemingly has been unchecked, especially during this election season. But God is restoring that, I believe, and calling us to properly build his house. We, he wants us 
to have this oneness of the faith, this oneness of the full, thorough, and accurate knowledge of the Son of God. And then thirdly, to a perfect man. That's the apostolic imperative. Colossians chapter 1, I believe verses 27, 28, 29, Paul talks about how he labored and how he worked seeking to see the saints come to a perfect man. This is who he desired to present to the Father. He says it here again, that we would come to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And when we look at the church today, when we look at the body of Christ, especially our being divided along the lines of ethnicity, along the lines of politics and other things that we're allowing to divide and to separate us, we can easily see that the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ finds us as a household and as a body wanting and lacking. His house, his church is universal. His house and his church, it is global. It is multi-ethnic. It is multicultural. Praise the Lord. It is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone in Ephesians chapter two. As a matter of fact, I want to read that Ephesians two, uh, beginning at verse 11, Ephesians two, verse 11. Let me get over here. Uh, it, it says to us, therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, talking about our former condition, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, again, he wants us to see more clearly, more accurately, more readily how he has situated us in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is, is he who has, uh, amen, done away with every division, those divisions that we seek to hold on to, those distinctions that we seek to, to gravitate to. He's done away with them. The Bible says, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself, listen to this, one new man, one new in nature, new in kind, humanity. That's the Father's house. That's the body of Christ. That's the church of the living God. From the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Every form of enmity, enmity should not be allowed to exist, amen, among us because Christ has put those things to death. And what he has given to us by position, we must make a reality in terms of our practice. Verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. And for, for through him, we both have access by one spirit to the father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. Listen to this with the saints and members of the household of God. So the believers everywhere, universally, globally are a part of the house hold of God because of what Jesus did, because of how Jesus has positioned us, amen, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole, by, whole building rather, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together, amen, that there's progressive and ongoing work that has to take place for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. This saints requires wise master builders who build his people according to his sequence for building, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 12, verse 28. We can't turn there, but just note that 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. Those who the Lord has placed in these roles of leadership are not to be those who divide his people, but to bring his people together, amen, in practice, in reality, in the way that we're living, in the way that we're engaging. There is one household. There is one family. Praise the Lord. There is one body. There is one church. Now, within a city or a region, 
when we talk about building a father's house, his house, amen, or within a city or a region, it is an expression of his house that is comprised of his sons and his daughters who recognize that there is only his church. So they're in Warren, they're in Detroit, they're in Michigan. You know this, there is only his church, there is only his household, and anything else which we allow to distinguish ourselves except that which is biblical and true of his house keeps us divided and causes us to misrepresent him. And so if we allow our ethnicity, if we allow our titles, if we allow our denominational affiliations, uh, if, if any of those things that we allow to distinguish ourselves from one another, amen, except those things which are biblical and true of his house, these things keep us up divided. If we allow our politics, our political persuasions, any of those things, praise the Lord, they divide us and also cause us to misrepresent him because it's in our oneness. Amen. It's in our oneness. It's where the, where the two become one and are indistinguishable. Amen. It's here that his household has received and embraces and embodies the oneness of sonship. And that's the essence of it. Jesus talks about it in John chapter 17. The glory that he had with the father was in the essence of his sonship. That, that's the same for us. We have the same father that makes us sons to that father, that makes us brothers with one another. Praise God. We're all in the same family. But anytime we're divided, what it does it is, is it, it undermines the witness to the reality of Jesus Christ being sent by God. So Jesus prayed for us to be one. Now, now, let me say this real quickly. When I talk about building a father's house, I also see his house as a sevenfold revelation, beginning with Jacob and extending to Jesus Christ, and then to us as a seventh fold, according to Hebrews chapter three, verse six, where it says, uh, Jesus is, uh, is over his house, whose house we are. We are the house of the Lord. It's not the buildings. It's not the mortar. Praise the Lord. It's the people. It's the church. Included in this sevenfold revelation of the house of God is Jacob's revelation of Bethel in Genesis chapter 28. It's not enough for us, amen, to, to, have to, 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 you know, to recognize or to see Bethel, but we also must know El Bethel, the God of the house. The house of God is about God himself. The house of God is about assembling the body of Christ, not just us knowing one another, but us knowing and representing Jesus. The second fold of this sevenfold revelation is the tabernacle of Moses, which is the most noteworthy structure because of its significance. The, uh, the tabernacle of David is number three. Amen. All had access to the tent, the tent or the tabernacle of David, according to Acts chapter 15 and Amos chapter 9. The temple of Solomon is the fourth in the sevenfold revelation. It's the most extravagant. It's the most magnificent. All of this is going to make sense here momentarily. The restored house of Zerubbabel is the fifth fold. Amen. Uh, we, we have to see the restoration books. Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi to see the restored house of Zerubbabel. And then the sixth fold in this revelation of the house of God is Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 14, verse 2. As a matter of fact, I, I want to speak to that just for a moment. In John chapter 14 and verse 2, uh, Jesus says that in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. But here's the thing. The chapter of the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John has nothing whatsoever to do with homes in heaven or even with heaven itself. Jesus spoke of how the Father is dwelling in him. The Father is dwelling in him and how if we keep Christ's commandments, the Father and Jesus will be dwelling in us, according to John chapter 14, verse 10, and then in verse 23, amen? John 14, 23, Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The word home in John 14, 23 is the same Greek word that's translated mansions 
in John 14 and 2. And listen to, listen to this. We're talking about building a father's house. So we need to know exactly what it is. We don't want to confuse it with anything else. Nowhere in the Bible does it state that heaven is God's house. Nowhere in scripture does it state that heaven is God's house. But in several places in the New Testament, it does refer to the Lord Jesus, amen, as God's house. We know according to uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, it reads, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Amen. So we Christians are being made part of God's house. We just read it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. The Father's house, as I said before, is first the Lord Jesus Christ, and then those who are a part of the body of Christ. There are many rooms in Christ, which are which we are called, praise the Lord, uh, which we are called to abide in, which we are called to dwell in. We will abide with Christ. We will be a part of the eternal tabernacle of God in these many rooms. When you read the remainder of John's gospel, chapter 14, it gives no indication whatsoever that Christ was referring to his worldwide second coming in which every eye should see him. Uh, but it does refer to a coming to his disciples to make them a part of himself. And I wish I could go further with that, but I just need you to see that Jesus Christ is the house of God. The seventh in the seventh fold of this uh, revelation of the house of God is the spiritual house that we are. According to Hebrews chapter three and verse six, I quoted it a few moments ago. First Corinthians chapter three, verse 16. Let's look at that verse. First Corinthians three and verse 16. And it tells us, praise God, first Corinthians three. Verse 16 says, do you not know that you are the temple of God or the house of God, that the spirit of God dwells in you? And then in 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul says to Timothy that you, you know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. So we are the spiritual house of the Lord as well. Now, building a father's house has as its overarching purpose that we might find and abide with he who is the house of God. I've got several scriptures. I'll, I'll quote them to get them on the, the video. Colossians 2 and 9, John 14, verse 10 through 11, John 14, verse 20, John 17, verse 21, John chapter 10, verse 38, and then we just read John 14 and 2. Lastly, as it talks about, as I talk about this revelation, building a father's house, which is it, it is designed to prevent us from randomly bringing his sons and daughters to maturity, while ensuring that everything built or imparted into his people takes its rise from God the Father as its bedrock and Christ the Son as its one and only foundation. Now, what we are currently currently experiencing is more of the shaking that's promised concerning the last days. For years, many have prophesied concerning these times of shaking. It wasn't just COVID. There have been some other things that have taken place. What has been happening uh, on the uh, economic front and on the political front, all of these things have been designed, I believe, in most importantly, most strategically to shake the church. Evidently, the promise of this prophetic shaking is not a recent occurrence. Prophets such as Isaiah and Ezekiel, and of course, Haggai, which we'll look at momentarily, spoke of these times. Matthew 24 and 29 talks about earthquakes in the last days. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26 through 29, quote Haggai, talking about the shaking in the last days. Revelation 16 and 18 talks about a great earthquake like no man has ever seen before. These, this gives us new covenant insight into these times as well. And so these shakings are not going, hey amen, anywhere. God has used this methodology uh, even in the past to rid his church and his people of those things not consistent with his kingdom, not consistent with his household. Now, I believe that Haggai's prophecy discloses a similar condition within the body of Christ today. 
as local expressions of Christ's body, we are so focused on our individual assemblies that we have neglected the Father's corporate house in our cities and in our regions. This is not just about uh, your personal home, but this is also, I think, includes in it a revelation of how we've neglected the Father's corporate house for our local assemblies. We have tremendous local assemblies in every city. Churches that are reaching thousands have all kinds of programs and, and, and things that are going on. But our cities are lying in waste as the Lord's house, his, his corporate house has been neglected. All of this, again, has allowed our cities and allowed our regions to be open prey to the work of the enemy. So in Haggai chapter 1, uh, amen, Haggai chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 2, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, this people says the time has not come the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? God was never saying to the church to neglect the local assemblies at the expense of the corporate house. It's not an either or, it is a both and. We are to give attention to the local calling, the local work, but at the same time, he has planted us in communities, in cities, and in regions for us to be a part of building his house. Scripture goes on to say, now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And I ask you to think of all the things that are taking place in our cities, the crime, the drugs, the, uh, the exploitation, the corruption, the things that are happening seemingly, even though we have churches that are thriving, our cities are hurting. People are committing suicide. People are overdosing. Gangs are running rampant. All manner of crime and evil are taking place. So the Lord says, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earn wages to put into a bag with holes. Amen. We know that we're living in the days now where the supply, praise the Lord, uh, where the demand rather is exceeding the supply. Hackers just hacked into the, uh, uh, the, the uh, colonial pipeline, held them hostage, caused there to be a shortage of fuel. We're seeing things like we've not seen before. And then even in the midst of that, we're still seeing churches that have all the, the lights and the bells and the whistles and the smoke and the mirrors and performances and all of these other kinds of things. And we're calling people to platforms, to performances, to personalities, but we're not calling people to the presence of the Lord. And a local assembly by itself cannot do that. God has invested this in the corporate man, in the, in, in the father's house. Praise God. Verse seven, it says, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now, now notice this because this is important as we move forward in this teaching, in verse eight, this is a critical verse. He says, go up to the mountains. So if you're taking notes, just jot down mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Again, this is a key verse. He says, go to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple or build the house that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house. There it is, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. That's what's happening all over the body of Christ all over the body of Christ. We're competing against one another. We're pro promoting ministries and programs. Uh, uh, amen. Saying to people, come here because this house is so much better. Failing to understand that we're all one house. And when we're doing those things, whether we're allowing politics or ethnicity or whatever it is to divide us, his house is going neglected, and he's allowing these shakings. He's allowing, amen, uh, this, this tribulation that we're going through to shake us so that the things that need to be removed will be removed, and the things that need to remain will remain. I believe that's one of the reasons the Lord allowed to send us home through this COVID-19. We were gathering in buildings, but we were not gathering to him. 
We were gathering to personalities. We were gathering to performances and all these other things, but we were not gathering to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We were not gathering for the assembly of the Father's house. The scripture, this 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 goes on, I and mean, we could we could go on into chapter two, praise the Lord, but I don't want to go too far over time. I at least want to go as long as Oz would go. Is that all right? Is that all right on Facebook? Can I go as long as Oz would go? Uh, but 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 understanding, listen to what he says. He says, uh, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withhold its fruit. For I call for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock and on all the labor of your lands. And the Lord allowed all of this to happen because he wanted a certain reaction from the people. He wanted a certain response. Verse 12, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the, uh, 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 the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people that needs to be changed, repentance, transformation among those who lead the church. These men are symbolic of leaders in the church, of the apostolic, of, of, of the pastoral, praise the Lord. And, and he says the entire remnant of the people, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. When we don't build the house of the Lord, what we rob ourselves of is the presence of the Lord. Amen. These people were now enable to experience the presence of the Lord. And then in verse 13, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I am with you, says the Lord. Amen. I am with you. He's not going to abandon us. He's going to be with us, but we have to prioritize him. That's, that's what Haggai was dealing with. He was dealing with wrong priorities in chapter one. And the church, we have wrong priorities. So, so the shaking will continue until his priorities become our priorities, until the building of his house, not just our individual houses, not just our local assemblies, glory be to God, but when we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things that he says that we're going to be denied, that we that he says that we're no longer going to be able to receive we, these droughts, all these other things that are taking place supernaturally because of our failure to prioritize his house, those things will, will cease, as it were, concerning us if we do things his way. Let me say this real quickly. Uh, 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 in verse 14, the Bible says, so the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. This is what we need in this day. We need this apostolic the prophetic, the fivefold to come together, being stirred by the spirit of the Lord into our cities and into our regions, not just to, to, to have a, a nice meeting or, or a nice you know, one-time encounter or visitation, but that our cities become the dwelling place of the most high God, that the people of God become stirred up, amen, not just the leaders, but God wants to stir the entire church to, to the work that he has assigned to us. In chapter two, I don't have time to go through all of it, but but uh, Haggai corrects wrong perspectives when he speaks to them because some individuals had experienced former moves of God. According to verse three, he's, he asked the question, who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your own eyes as nothing? And so what God is doing and what God will do Praise the Lord. It may not be anything like what he has done, but it will still be the work of the Lord. He says in verse four, yet now be strong, Zerubbabel. And I say this to Lord of the Lord of the harvest and to the elders and to Pastor Oz and even to those that will hear in Detroit and in Warren and in Michigan. Be strong, Joshua. Amen. Son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, says the Lord, and work. It is time for us to work at building the Father's house, for I am with you. God is with us. We can't fail. 
He says, the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenant with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. The time shouldn't make us afraid. People falling away from the Lord shouldn't make us afraid. Folk embracing nationalistic idolatry and claiming and calling it a religion and the church, those kinds of things should not make us afraid. The Lord is with us. Verse six, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land. I will shake all nations and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. The desire of all nations is Jesus Christ. I established before that Jesus Christ is the house of God. When the people of God start desiring the desire of the Lord, the desire of all nations, that's when they will begin to come. That's when the Lord will begin to fill his temple with glory. I, I got to stop right there in that section, but I got more to, more to teach. Praise the Lord. Hang on in here. But we pray, Father, correct our wrong priorities, correct our wrong perspectives among your leaders and among your people. So both Micah and Isaiah, Micah and Isaiah, I read Micah 4 verses 1 through 5, and then also in Isaiah chapter 2 verses 1 through 4, they both were given a pre-exilic perspective to the inseparable connection between God's kingdom and his house, between God's kingdom and his house. The two, God's kingdom and God's house, they are inextricably woven together. The message of the mountain. Remember what we read in Haggai chapter one. Where did, he, where did Haggai instruct them to go? To go to the mountain to get wood, to get timber, to build the father's house. Why? Because his house had been neglected. And we're going to see why, why, what all this means and how all this fits in just a moment. But the message of the mountain and the message of the house are so important that God gave a similar message again to two of his prophets, to both Micah and Isaiah. So let's go back. Let's go back to Micah chapter four, verses one through five. And let's talk about this in the remaining time that we have. In verse one, in Micah chapter four, it says, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the, the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and, he says, shall be exalted above the hills and the people, the people, the scripture says, the people shall flow to it. Now we, we have to, in order to see this properly, we have to look back at Micah chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Now notice notice the conditions into which Micah prophesied. They, they seem to be just like the conditions we have now within the church. So in verse 8 of Micah 3, it reads, but truly I am full of power. He's contrasting himself, amen, to the false prophets in chapter six, um, verses 6 and 7 of Micah 3. We've had this emergence of those who prophesied either falsely or were false prophets. We know that in the last days, that because of the, the unclean spirit that exists, amen, within the body or within the nation, that there would be uh, false prophets and false teachings, as Pastor Oz has taught you, that will uh, afford uh, these false narratives, if you will. People will begin to believe things about themselves and believe things about God that are not true. And so Micah says that he is full of the spirit, that these false prophets are not. He says, but truly I am full of spirit by the, full of power rather, by the spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. In order for us to properly build the father's house, we must have prophets that will declare, praise the Lord, things of justice and the might of the Lord and declare to the church, to Jacob and his transgression and to Israel her sin. We need to be confronted with our sins, with our wrong, those things that should not exist within the Father's house. If the church has been taken out of Christ, then whatever's in Christ ought to be in the church, and whatever's not in Christ should not be in the church. So God continues to send his prophets and his apostles to point out those things 
that are in us and in our midst that should not be. And we know that biblical justice and biblical righteousness are not in proper place in the church. Verse nine, he says, now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and pervert all equity. You see that? And twist all equity. They abhor justice. You, we, we have churches that are backing away from God's idea of justice. They hate God's idea of justice. They pervert all equity. Who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity. There were believers who uh, uh, tried to you know, lay siege to the capital on January the 6th. There were Christians there. He says, who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity. Her heads judge for a bribe. Her priests teach for pay and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? No harm can come to come upon us. Therefore, because of you, here, here it is. This is the destruction. Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. And now uh, Micah begins to prophesy restoration in chapter four, verse one. Now it should come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and the people shall, and people shall flow to it. And so we know that this actually took place in the days of the destruction by Nebuchadnezzar in 536 BC. And, but in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house is to be restored after its prophesied destruction, which we just read about. Mountain is symbolic of his kingdom. House is symbolic of the Lord's church. I need you to put that, put that in your notes. I might have to come back another time, Oz, and finish this up. But, but listen to this. We know that the mountain of the Lord's house, praise the Lord, this mountain again is symbolic of the kingdom. The house is symbolic of the church established in the top of the mountains, above Mount Gibeon, above Mount Zion, above Mount Moriah, exalted above the hills, if you will. People, the scripture says, will flow to it. That's unnatural. It will take a supernatural drawing uphill. We'll talk about that in a moment. The verse two tells us that nations will come in. The Gentile nations will come into the house of the Lord, the church. And we need to understand this, that even those in the church who have been guilty of nationalistic idolatry, amen, American nationalism is not a kingdom concept. It's not a Christian uh, principle, if you will. The, there's only one nation that Jesus died for. And that's the holy nation, amen, the holy nation of God. He's only concerned about that nation. He's only concerned about his house. And we need to understand that, to associate, to assemble ourselves, to connect ourselves with this nationalistic idolatry, praise the Lord, is to operate in a manner and in a way that is not consistent with the household of God, amen. So, so, so we understand that these Gentile nations will come into the house of the Lord. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. Mark 16, verse 15 through 20. Acts 1, verse 8. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 10 through 13. Acts chapter 10, verse 45. All of those places, they speak of the Gentile nations coming into the house of the Lord. Now, it says that they're coming into the mountain. Again, this is, this is the kingdom. The mountain is the kingdom. That The kingdom that the Lord is concerned about is his own kingdom. We understand that the kingdoms of this world will soon become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. They will come into the kingdom. Many nations, verse 2 says, shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the Lord of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. Amen. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths for out of Zion, the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So let, let, let me say this. Let me say this. The mountain, praise the Lord, 
we, we've got to consider these mountains first because this is the first place of significance, this mountain. And God's dealing with his people and especially the chosen nation of Israel. God often dealt with them, praise God, relative to mountains in geographical places. The Ark of Noah, it rested at Mount Ararat. Amen. That's where the, the that's the mountain of the Noahic covenant. Abraham offered Isaac typically on an appointed mountain on Mount Moriah, which became the mountain of substitution. Genesis chapter 22. Israel, Israel, after the exodus from Egypt, met God at Mount Sinai. This is where the father spoke to them as a nation. And then afterwards, through his prophet Moses, this became the mountain of the law of covenant. When Israel, praise God, entered the promised land, six tribes assembled on Mount Ebal, the mountain of cursing, and six tribes assembled on Mount Gerizim, the mountain of blessings. The Levites stood in the valley with the Ark of the Covenant as they uttered the cursings and blessings of disobedience or obedience to the law. There's mountains that are listed in the Song of Solomon. The psalmist speaks of Mount Hermon in Psalm 133. And of all the mountains about Jerusalem and the mountain experiences in Israel in their history, under God, in God's economy, there were three most important mountains. There were Mount Sinai, Mount Zion, and Mount Moriah. Mount Sinai, Mount Zion, and Mount Moriah. And so you have to ask the question, why these mountains? Why are they so important in Israel's history? How do they, these mountains bring us to the house? The, and it's important for us to see this, the mountain and the house cannot be separated. The kingdom and the church cannot be separated. Those that are going about just teaching kingdom, 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 amen, as if the church doesn't matter, are totally missing it. They have an incomplete message. The mountain, the kingdom, amen, the house and the church cannot be separated. When we look at the house, the reason that these three mountains, again, Sinai, Zion, and Moriah, the reason that these three mountains are seen as holy mountains, amen, and, because, and the reason they held such importance in Israel's history was that in each of these mountains, there was a house. In each of these mountains, there was a house. The house was God's dwelling place among his people. Mount Sinai had God's first house constructed, amen, and revealed in it. God's first dwelling place, the tabernacle of the Lord, commonly referred to as the tabernacle of Moses. Amen. The tabernacle of Moses is the most noteworthy structure because of its significance. Read Exodus 25 down through verse chapter 40. Mount Zion had God's next dwelling place. This was the tabernacle of David. Here the ark of God was placed. This is where David under God set up a whole new order of praise and worship to God with singers and with musicians. Mount Zion became known as the joy of the whole world. This is where we get uh, we, we get those Zion Psalms. I know you, you guys have been studying the Psalms last year, reading and meditating the Psalm every day. Mount Zion takes on great significance in Israel's history from this time on, all because of God's house, which is the tabernacle of David, because it was there, because it was present, and the ark of God was there. The ark of God never returned to the tabernacle of Moses once the tabernacle of David was set up. The presence of the Lord was there. The presence of God was there in the house. And then thirdly, there is Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah becomes the next holy mountain in the history of Israel, simply because we understand that Solomon built the house of the Lord. He built this temple, the house of the Lord. The ark of God was taken from the tent or the tabernacle of David, and it was placed in the holiest of all in the temple. Now, in Isaiah chapter two, verses one through four, we see Isaiah linking the mountain and the house. This is important for us. This is a vital message for us in these last days that the Lord is linking his kingdom with his house not merely with his houses. He's linking his kingdom with his house. He, Isaiah begins to speak to this just like Micah did. They spoke to this first of all in the literal sense, and then they begin to speak 
about it in the in the spiritual sense. And so this is kind of where we're going to conclude for today. The Old Testament prophets, the New Testament prophets, you understand it. They use the natural and the material, praise God, in, in order to point to the symbolical and the spiritual. And so as it pertains to the mountain, I need you to get this because you, you, you're seeing kingdoms being decimated. We've seen it historically. America will be destroyed, I believe, if America does not reassume her place as it pertains to the church. God did not raise up and favor America in order for her to become this, this uh, kingdom to herself, to proclaim herself to be God's kingdom or God's house. No, her place, America's place, is to support and advance the kingdom of God and the church. And America has forsaken this position and sought to raise herself up as something that the Lord never intended. And, and another part of that is many in the church have embraced this same ideology and are proclaiming it from our pulpits and embracing something that, it, that has to be error. So as it pertains to the mountain, the scripture teaches us that God used natural or geographical mountains to symbolize a kingdom. In Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 24 through 25, Babylon is likened to a destroying mountain. So God will raise up mountains and he will use them if, if need be to destroy his people to, and to only leave a remnant. In Daniel chapter two, verse 35, the stone points to, to Christ, the stone kingdom of God and his, and his Christ. You know and understand that. In Revelation chapter 17, verses nine through 11, the woman sits on seven hills, seven mountains or seven kings or kingdoms that will be overthrown at the Lord's second advent. A mountain then in scripture is used to symbolize a kingdom. I've said this before, whether a world kingdom or the kingdom of God. So both Isaiah and Micah are prophesying that the mountain, amen, the kingdom of God is to be established. That's what we're going to see. It will be exalted, listen to this, above all the kingdoms of this world in God's time. And God is working this out right now. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and his Christ, according to Revelation 11 and 15. Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, They both chapters, they confirm the truth that the kingdom of God will crush and destroy the kingdoms of the world. Jesus Christ, we know it according to Revelation 19, 16, is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So the mountain is significant. This kingdom is significant. We are not to go to the world's kingdom to find out how we're who we are to be and what it is we're supposed to do. Where righteousness and justice is concerned, where ministry is concerned, where living and loving and learning and leading are concerned, we are to go to the mountain of the Lord, to the kingdom of God. As it pertains to the house, the scripture teaches us that a house is symbolical of the church. The New Testament writers, they all speak of the church as being the house of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, Peter says that, that judgment begins at the house of God. I believe in this time, there is a type of judgment that is taking place on the house of God. God is uh, elevating his standard to see if we, the church, will rise, if we will come out of that, which are uh, the traditions of men and, and those things that make the word of God none effect, that we will lay aside everything, praise the Lord, except that which exalt the name. Name of Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 through 9, we see that believers are being built up a spiritual house. We looked at 1 Timothy 3, 15, where it tells us that we ought to know how we are to behave ourselves in the house of God. We looked at Ephesians 2, 17 through 22. The church is the household of God, not a local expression, not a denomination, but the global church, the universal church. We are the house of God, and the house of God in our cities are being neglected. We're giving more attention to our individual churches, our individual works. This word household is a very, very interesting word. Give me about 13 more minutes. It, this word household, it, it means a house 
it means a household, it, 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 it's, uh, it means belonging to a certain household, it, it's used of persons that are of one family, and so it speaks of kinsmen. And so if we are building the Father's house, we need to be open to the nations that the Lord says that are to gather among us. We cannot be Christian racist. We cannot be those, praise God, who, who see one another based on ethnicity. We cannot be those kind of individuals and be those persons, praise the Lord, that are a part of the Lord's house. The church is now the house of the Lord or the Lord's house, which Isaiah prophesied. It is the church that is to be established in the last days. That's why so many places that were called churches, are, I believe, have closed down to never open again because God was not building those places. He's building his house and he is looking for places like Lord of the Harvest that are zealous to build his house. Many won't understand this. Many won't appreciate it. Praise the Lord. We, we may receive pushback. People may leave. That's why the words spoken in Haggai are so important. We cannot be afraid, amen, to obey God. We cannot be afraid when the spirit begins to stir us to follow the will of the Lord. This house, this church is being established in the last days in the top of the mountains, above the hills of the world, of the world's kingdoms. The other side of the cross, God's house was the tabernacle of Moses or the tabernacle of David, or the tabernacle of Solomon. But on this side of the cross, the new covenant church, amen, is God's house, of which all others were merely types, shadows, or prophecies. Jesus brings the two truths together, amen, the two truths of the mountain and the house. He brings them into clear words when he says in Matthew chapter 16, we got to read that, we got to read that, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew, I'm going to run out of time before I run out of word. Matthew chapter 16. Let's look at verse 18 through 19, because Jesus brings these two truths together, this mountain and, and this house together. In Matthew 16, verse 18, it says, and also I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. There's the house. Amen. We see the rock and we see the house, the mountain and the house and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, the kingdom, the mountain, amen, of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is what the scripture says. Jesus brings these two truths together. The kingdom and the church, they are distinguishable, but they are also inseparable. The kingdom and the house, they belong, praise the Lord, to each other. The kingdom slash mountain will be exalted above all the old covenant actual symbolic mountains. The house slash the church will be established above the old covenant material and sub symbolic houses. The church and the kingdom will be raised above the tabernacle in Mount Sinai, the tabernacle in Mount Zion, the tabernacle in Mount, in Mount Moriah. Now Christ will be exalted, listen to this, above Moses, above David, above Solomon, praise the Lord, for he is prophet, priest, and king in, in, the, in the one person and each of the typical structure, structures that we talked about, everything that we mentioned here today, they all pointed to Christ. They all pointed to Christ in his kingdom. They all pointed to Christ, the head over all things in his church. All right, so all nations, praise the Lord. The purpose of the church in the mountain is clear. Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied, Micah prophesies that all nations are to flow into the house of the Lord. All nations, all nations, all nations, all nations. Amen. The church will be established. The church will be exalted. Even though there is much reproach, praise the Lord, on the church right now, the church will not be a failure. God will have a glorious church without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. Praise God. Amen. The new church is for all, the New Testament church, the new covenant church is for all nations. That's why it's not just a local expression. It's that entire church that's in Warren, that's in Detroit, praise God, that's in, in Michigan, 
The Great Commission involved the making of disciples of all nations. The church will teach God's ways to God's people so that we can walk in God's ways. That's what, that's what, that's what Micah talks about. That's what Micah talks about, praise the Lord, uh, in, in, in uh, verse 3. Praise God. In verse four, verse five, verse verse four, four and five in particular. That's our role. I, I wish I had more time. The church will see people flow to it. It will be an unnatural flow. It's unnatural for anything to flow uphill. To get a flow uphill, you generally need a pump. You need something to to move it uphill. But 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 there is the Lord in His house. And this is why we must build his house, because it's the Lord in his house, standing in the midst of his house that will become a great magnet and drawing people to himself supernaturally by his spirit, according to John chapter 13, verse 32. Amen. The church is to be the place of peace and a place of warfare. Hallelujah. Amen. I think I think I'm going to wrap up right there. I, I can go on. There's so much to this. I, I just want you to realize that if you are lifting up, if you are embracing, if you are affiliating yourself with anything above the Lord's house in his kingdom, this mountain in this house, you need to repent. You need to repent. Whatever it is that you may have uh, used to somehow differentiate yourself from those who, we're all sons of the same father. That makes us brothers. Amen. And we're all in his house. And he has chosen to put his house and his kingdom together. We're going to see this emerge in the last days. You're going to hear more and more proclaiming this word. This is the apostolic imperative. I'll make this final statement and I will pray. The end of this is that the world may see a many-membered Christ, a corporate man. And we know that Christ is the house of God, a mature church, a church that's no longer infants being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, the cunning craftiness of men wherein they lay in a way to deceive us, but a church that speaks the truth in love, a church where every joint carries a a supply and functions in, a, in the sphere of love. In the Father's house, there is maturity. In the Father's house, there is oneness. It, it's not unity, but there is unanimity. In the Father's house, all the other agendas fade away. All the other gods fade away. There's only Jesus Christ. There's only the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. And in the scriptures with these precious saints, I pray that something, Lord, was said today that will cause them to be stirred to pursue your kingdom and your house, the kingdom and the mountain, the house, the church, to pursue Christ. That which has been spoken and prophesied and proclaimed over them for the kind of church that they are to be. Their calling is unique in that region. Their calling is to gather others together and be, be a part of those that come together to form your house. I pray, Lord God, that those who have heard it will be so impressed to seek you and to get instructions and order from you, for orders from you in terms of how to walk this out. I pray over the leadership of this ministry. I pray that great grace, greater grace, come upon Pastor Oz and Ben and all of the elders and those that labor together with them, that they will become a shining example of a people that is leading the way in the building of the Father's house. Lord God, we want to see you glorified, and we want to see you exalted, and we want to see your many-membered Christ raised up in these last days. And we want to see nations come into them. And so, Father, we bless you and we honor you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, I'm done. Uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Oz. Thank you, Lord of the Harvest. Uh, thank you, Rob and Andrea. Uh, and if there's nothing else,
I'm going to log off. God bless those on Facebook. Amen. And uh, we bless the Lord. Let's build the Father's house. Love you all. Blessings. Bye now.